We are good to go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Whitmix Corporation with our ortho webinar today. So I just want to go ahead and just do some basics. Uh, if you go ahead and look at the right hand side of your screen, you have the ability to ask uh, any questions throughout the whole webinar. Um, and today's webinar is going to be on the basics of three shape ortho analyzer today we have matthew davis with us and we have sherry weatherby matthew davis is a CAD cam support specialist at whitmix and sherry weatherby is a territory sales manager here at whitmix corporation if you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves and then i'll go ahead and give a brief introduction of what the topic is going to cover and then we'll get started I'll go first, I guess. <laughs> My name is Matt. Uh, I worked at an ortho lab for four years before uh, Corey, I met Corey and he was helping me with some uh, installs that we were doing and he poached me. <laughs> and so we have been working together for a few months now. Uh, still kind of learning some, some of the ropes, but uh, loving it so far. Very good. And I'm Sherry Weatherby. Um, I've been back at Whitmix now for five years as a um, territory sales manager for all things digital. So if you have any questions um, about getting started with the ortho software after the um, webinar, feel free to reach out to me and I will get you pointed in the right direction. Awesome. Thank you, Matt and Sherry both. So this morning, I just want to dive a little bit deeper with Matt. So Matt is actually our digital support specialist here at Whitmix. Before he actually came to Whitmix, he worked at a orthodontic laboratory for four years, and he was actually a key integral part in transitioning the lab from a analog lab to a digital lab. Uh, very similar to like um, and how I actually got into the industry and same with Bryce Hiller as well. And so uh, during his years, he transformed the laboratory. And when he started in there, he was actually, uh, he actually took a really deep dive into 3D printers. So he has experience with the Stratasys 3D printers and Vision Tech carbon printers. Now the Asiga printers and of course our Verabilt 3D printers. And so with that, he has a, a excellent uh, knowledge base for 3D printing and on the ortho application side as well. So he's been an excellent addition to the team. And so with that, Matt, go ahead and take it away. Let's see what you have to show us today on our ortho system software from 3Shape. All righty. Um, today we are going to just minimize this and get this out of the way so it's not going to bother us here. Um, we're just going to be talking about some basics here, and Corey, you're pretty familiar with everything as well. So if you see anything that you that I miss, or if you think of good questions to ask, please jump in or Sherry as well. Um, so this w little window that you see right here, um, this is actually called your patient browser. So the way that the ortho system works is a little different than the dental system. The ortho system sorts everything by patients, and then you can have multiple model sets or multiple cases for each patient. Um, and that's really good actually for, in case you do like pre-orthodontic work, you wanna take a record uh, before you do any work, and then at a final stage or anywhere in between. Um, so it's really great. Uh, that way you don't have to keep creating new cases and new cases and new cases for the same patient. It can all be lumped together and you can see all of the work that you've done for the same patient if you wanna organize it that way. Um, so you can see I have a ton of work on mine, but that's okay because this is just for demonstrations. Um, so you'll see there's a bunch of uh, a bunch of buttons up here, and the great thing about Ortho Analyzer is usually they have a, a couple of different ways of doing the same process. So it's all about just what makes more sense to you. All of these buttons that are up here, you can also access the same buttons or some of the same buttons by right clicking on the patients or um, right clicking on those model sets once you have those made. Um, but we're going to start new and make a new patient. Uh, you could put in your, if you have like an internal uh, barcode system or something along those lines to track individual patients. But for this case, we're just going to do a Jane Doe case. And this is what I like about the the ortho system software compared to dental system. Dental system, you start at the order form and then you prescribe what every move 
after that is going to be. With ortho system, you're not so, um, I guess, uh, tethered. Yeah, tethered to that exact workflow. So you can create a case, import scans, and then you have different workflows that you can jump in and out of without any sort of restrictions, yeah. I guess you could say. Yeah, it's it's definitely, to me, it makes a little bit more sense, uh, but that's also because I've been using it and I don't have as much experience <laughs> with the dental system, but uh, it does make a little bit more sense and it is a lot more freeing, uh, just like you were saying, especially once you start getting into designing other uh, appliances like indirect bonding or splints, it definitely helps a lot. So, um, but once you've filled out all the information that you have or you'd like to fill out, hit create. And so now we have the patient, but we don't have any models to work with. So what we're gonna do is come up here and click on the, this says new model set, or you can right click and click new model set, same difference. Um, right here, same thing again, you can put in uh, the number or the date. Like, it, like I said, if this was uh, beginning models, you could label it. So in the future, you know, this is where you started. And one of the cooler parts is you have the actual option here of telling the system if you don't have an upper, you can uncheck that box um, or just the upper or both. Um, so just checking those boxes, they're a toggle thing. So it's not, uh, not you have to click it every time, but just you click it if you don't want those on there. Very good. And you don't have to worry too much about the general um, really what you want to worry about is this maxillary and mandibular import here. And this, we're, since I don't have an actual scanner, I'm not going to be scanning, um, but it, you can do the scanning with the same soft, the same process here as well. Um, but for this case, we're just going to be importing scans, which in a lab or uh, even in a doctor's office, this would be a really common way of importing these and pulling these in. Um, and you can see the preview. Also, if you had a CT scan that you wanted to import, this would be the place to import that here. Very um, cool. Is there a specific format that the CT scan needs to be in or? I believe DICOM files are pretty much the only, yeah, it's just a DICOM loader. So I don't think it accepts any other kinds, but you might know a little bit more about that, Corey, if it accepts any other uh, file types besides DICOM? To my knowledge, it's not. That was a, that was a, a, a softball question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just the, the DICOM. And just to let everybody know that, uh, that are uh, attending and watching, if you have any questions anytime, please feel free to ask uh, and, and we'll be able to answer as we're going. Yep. So yeah, just DICOMs, uh, but you don't have to select all of them. You just select the folder where it's located and it'll automatically import all of those pictures, all of those images. Can you imagine what it would be like if you had to upload <laughs> every single image? <laughs> Some uh, There was a software I was using, I can't remember, but you had to highlight all of them. And if I missed one, it messed up and it wouldn't load. And it just kind of was a little frustrating. That would be awful. They, I think they patched it pretty quick, but. Yeah. Um, so you can see here, it just, this is a, I call this the landing page for your patient. Um, it has a lot of options and a lot of features that are built into this landing page. Uh, we're not going to worry about those right now. What we want to focus on is getting these uh, wafer thin scans that I call shells. We want to put them uh, with a base. We want to solidify them and make them ready to print. 90% um, of the time, that's what you're going to be looking to do with these models. So, And that's what OrthoAnalyzer is built to do. Um, so we're just going to find our patient that we just made. And you can see this red exclamation mark here. That just indicates that these models are imported, but they have not been prepared in any way. So they are just raw scans. Um, but we're going to fix that right here. We're just going to come down here and click Prepare Model Set. Or if you want, you can come up here and click this little um, base icon. Simple enough? Pretty easy. Uh, as cool as this feature is, I, I know that they <laughs> that Three Shape as a company tries to push the envelope and make things cooler and newer. Uh, the colors, though, the real life colors, I think, make it way harder to work with <laughs> in the software. That's just my personal opinion and experience, but not it, everybody's the same way. <laughs> I com I completely agree. So on the on the dental manager side. I also turn off the the 
real view texture, uh, a real life texture scan, uh, coloring and go to the monochromatic scans. Now, I do find it sometimes helpful when marking a margin or a preparation line. However, with the appliance designer or ortho system softwares, that's something that would not be necessary. Definitely. Um, but it's still if you a nice ever feature. do want to turn it back on or off, it's right here. Um, a really common mistake that most people find themselves in is they accidentally, when moving with their camera here, they accidentally right click over here and uncheck this box. And so then when they come in here with a new scan, they can't find that to be able to turn it back off. Um, you just right click on the one of the few, the viewfinder buttons over here and un recheck that. And then those uh, view options uh, show up there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you're not familiar with CAD or any of these programs, you use your right click and hold to rotate your middle mouse button, push in and holding that while you move your mouse, it will pan the object. And the great thing that I actually really liked about three shape from the beginning is your left mouse click button is exclusively reserved for your tools and everything that you're using. So you never have to worry about moving your object or moving the camera by just clicking on trying to use your tool. I personally really like that feature. Yeah, always it's always a command yeah. of some sort or a completion of a command. Um, really quick, this uh, up in the center at the very top, this is our overall workflow. Um, and you can kind of see this button is slightly more highlighted. It might be a little difficult to see on my screen, um, but you can see as I mouse over these, it kind of highlights them a little bit more. But the screen checkbox being the end of the entire process. And this is where we are at currently in the process. Um, so that if you're looking to see where you're at in the steps, um, that's a good way to find out. Um, another thing is this left-hand side. If you're new to the software or new to even new to dentistry and orthodontics and you're using the software, the left-hand side here is gonna be your bread and butter because three shape is really good about um, giving hints and clues as to what you should be doing, what step you're on. So in this case, we're setting up our plane alignment. And so it's asking to set up the occlusion plane. And this little eye is saying we need to set a landmark for tooth number three. And so what it's asking for is to just click a point on tooth number three. And now it's asking for a landmark between eight and nine. Um, we can click on tooth number eight. And then now it's asking for tooth landmark number 14 and there. And so now it has that occlusal plane. Um, and the next step, it automatically goes into a sagittal plane. And one big pitfall that a lot of people run into at this point right here is they want to try to move that eight or nine, or maybe I want to move this 14 down to here. You can do that. But right now, the computer is actually asking you to set up the sagittal plane. So if I come over here and try to move number 14, you can see it starts drawing a line. And what that's doing is actually drawing the sagittal plane. Oh. Uh, so it's a really I've, common mistake. <laughs> I have a quick question. So I saw that you uh, placed your points on tooth number three and tooth number 14 on the buckle cuss tips. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it matter if you use buckle or lingual? Um, my general understanding is that you want to try to set a plane that if you were to put that mouth down on a flat surface, those the top cusps, and I've generally found that the buckle cusp on the maxillary to be the highest point of contour for the most part. Okay. All right. I had one of the, uh, an actual attendee said to, it's better to be place it on the mesolingual cusp tip of the first molar. Um, I'd be curious to see what, you know, what three shape, if they have any sort of, uh, I guess rhyme or reason between lingual or buckle since they don't actually specify either way uh, yeah. in the actual and software. Again, from my experience, it, it all of this step right here, setting up these planes, the only thing that it really affects, at least for this portion, is uh, your viewfinder buttons. Yeah. So those viewfinders are all set based on this. So if you mess this part up, then your viewfinders are going to be messed up later. Um, if you get down into more uh, appliances like splints and indirect bonding, those can be affected by your occlusal plane and sagittal plane. But uh, okay. these, mid these little minor shifts right here are not necessarily going to make or break your appliance. 
again, that's just my personal experience. But yeah, so the software is made to be very flexible with a lot of different people's user knowledge. So, yeah. you know, the new lab technician can kind of get in and start doing stuff with a lot of the base parameters that uh, three shape has in place. Absolutely. Um, so once you draw your sagittal plane here, you can see that I was moving these points. So if you do make a mistake or want to move it, you can do that once all of your points are set. And you can also click these orbs to rotate or move the sagittal plane if you need to um, do that. You can also rotate your camera if you want to look at it different uh, angles and see kind of where you're at. Um, that's pretty much it for this section here. Um, and now you can see, since I'm done with my my sagittal plane and occlusal plane, I can actually use these viewfinders to orient the models however I need. Um, and I always tell people uh, who are new to the system, because when you're not used to using CAD software or using computer-assisted design, you're going to have these instances where you're zoomed in and trying to figure out where things are and you get lost. Um, and so I always say use these viewfinders because they have a home position that kind of resets for you so you don't have to try to manually find your way back to uh, a good position. Yeah, I always use those. So after, for example, like for a new customer training, um, I show that last, <laughs> oh, yeah. so that so that so that the users can it can uh, it forces them to get used to the actual mouse instead of cheating and and <laughs> using the easy viewfinders. Uh, maybe yeah. not last, but it, it's it's uh, after twenty minutes of the the struggle bus, <laughs> and then say just to let you know there is an easy button, but at least it it forces the foundation of how yeah, to use the mouse for sure. It's definitely it comes with practice. Yeah. Um. So now what we're going to be doing we're adding a virtual base onto these models and it's wanting me to define the cut so it's wanting me to just outline the portions of the models that i want to include in this um for this model um i'm going to show two different ways to do this and it's all personal preference neither is better than the other uh, as you can see i'm just clicking and dragging kind of drawing it with my mouse and you can see as i move my mouse further away, it's just going to automatically draw a straight line and connect those. So this way is usually preferred by people who are really comfortable with like CAD software, Photoshop, um, any of those kinds of things, Mesh Mixer, Blender, uh, people who are used to drawing with their mouse a lot more. Um, the other way is a click and point system. So this is a lot more technical. And usually I've seen people who are less comfortable with using a mouse and digital software do it this way. It just is easier for them, makes more sense. Um, both are totally fine and there's really not too much of a speed difference between the two. It's all just about personal preference. I'm the clicker. I, I like to click my points all the way around. See, everybody's different. <laughs> <laughs> I am I am uncomfortable with using my mouse, therefore <laughs> I, I click. I take that personal. I hey, you know, we all we all got our our things to do, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, and so you can see the points are movable also after you've set them all. So if you need to even add a point, you can right click on this spline here and add a point. Uh, you can also remove a point if you have one that you don't want. You can just right click on the point and remove it. But I like this. Um, this looks pretty good. And I don't see any errors. So we're just going to click next. And so this part kind of is a little overwhelming for people who are not used to it as well. Uh, the blue represents the upper portion or the maxillary and the green represents the lower mandibular. Um, one thing that you have to make sure at this point is that the green splines that you drew in the previous steps are completely encompassed by the perimeter here. So just to showcase kind of what it would look like, if I moved this base down here, you can see this green line that I drew is sticking out. If I were to hit next, we get an error. Um, I'd say most of the time, or sometimes at least, 3Shape has a pretty good error system of saying what you need to do to fix it. And this one's saying 
the bases of models should contain the, con the cut spline. So we just click OK. It resets it back to default. And luckily, everything in the default setting is good. Um, from this section, you actually do have the option of all these different bases if you want to change how they look. Um, if you're wanting to create a base specifically for um, like display or if you have um, board models that you're wanting to create, you can use the ABO designs. But pretty much stuck with the full upper, full lower. Do you have anything specific that you usually add here, Corey? No, actually, this looks this looks good. You know, this is where you can control uh, at least your first point of control for the size of the model. And so, if you're looking at uh, producing this via printing, then this is your starting point of uh, reducing the amount of resin you're going to use to to print the object. Um, yeah. And also, of course, that would be the time it takes to print the object as well. Yes. Um, you can see here, if I click and drag, I can um, make the, bi the base smaller, less wide. Um, there's just a lot of features here. You also have over here, um, you can tell the program how, if you need the height of the models to be a certain set or a certain millimeter, then you do have that feature built in here as well. Very cool. Now, if you hold, um, just out of curiosity, if you hold the control key and then, okay, yeah, so you can scale it all... Does it allow you to scale if you hold the control like all green points? It does or maybe not, try, sh cause try sh a, shift. I didn't know if. Yeah, shift uh, doesn't. Uh, this is the if I oh, if I hold control, this is what shows up here. Okay, and I didn't know. Sometimes in uh, other three shape aspects or other three shape softwares, if you hold control, it'll allow like all the green points to scale down the same amount as you're moving the mouse. Yeah. This is one of those that are not built that way, but it does move all of the points. Um, it scales everything. So it does kind of do that just by itself, um, just not exactly the way that you're thinking. And most of the other program does that as well. Gotcha. Um, so once you're good with the, the base and position of everything, which I'm going to tighten this up just a little bit. One thing I want to point out, you can have the teeth sticking out. It's those green splines once again. That's the important part that needs to be included. We'll hit next. It'll calculate, pull out its TI-83 calculator and get this all figured out here. <laughs> and there you go. You have some models. Technically, they are printable. But like Corey said, we don't want to waste all this material just on a base unless we want that. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate this toolkit um, and how to clean these up so that you can have shorter models that are printed just for, uh, let's say, like a suck down Essex retainer or maybe a Holly retainer. So we'll, in this case, a really common um, prescription that a doctor will give is uh, an upper Holly retainer and a lower Essex retainer. Um, so I'm going to just showcase how you would do that in for this case. Um, really quick, the spline cut tool, you have your plane cut tool, uh, remove artifacts tool, which looks like a band-aid, your morphing tool, and your wax knife. So I'm going to start big and work my way small. We're going to start with the spline cut tool here. Um, the spline cut works based on your camera view. So wherever your camera is pointing, that's the direction that the, the cut's going to form. And I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. Uh, it also will cut one side or the other, depending on the direction that you're moving your cut. So if you move, you can see I'm kind of cutting clockwise. That means that the teeth or inside here is going to be saved and everything outside is going to be cut. If I were to cut counterclockwise, going up around the teeth this way, it would keep the outside and cut the inside. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, it's kind of a weird <laughs> little quirk, but I figured that out and got used to that pretty quickly. Instead of, I was cutting the other way naturally, and it always I would always have to hit this reverse direction, and so I tried cutting the other way and figured out that that's just how the program works. 
Um, so you can see here that I have these blue orbs that I can click and move with the red line. And that's showing what's going to be where the cut line is. If I move my camera here, though, you can see that it shows a visual representation of that cut in three dimensional space. Um, one thing to remember is if I move here my camera and then I click the spline, maybe I wanted to cut into this model here. You can see that it's still orienting that cut based on our, our original view. So moving your camera view is not going to change how that cut is determined. It's just something to keep in mind. So that's kind of nice. So if you needed to go ahead and re if you were adjusting your spline line, it's not going to recalculate it according to that view that you were looking at when you make your adjustment. Correct. So it's always going to retain that original view. Um, but once you're done, there's a couple of different ways you can finish it. You can click the first point and it'll complete the line, or you can come over here and hit the play button and click apply. That's kind of nice. So in other three shape softwares, you actually have to finish the line before mm -hmm. it'll allow you to complete. In this software, you can just so draw just it to wherever button. you want, stop, and then it will complete yeah. the process. Yep. I spent probably the first year working with the software, completing the whole circle. And Every second counts. Every <laughs> second counts when you're doing, you know, 100 cases a day. <laughs> um, you can see here that I'm making these uh, points for this next cut, and they're very rigid lines. I don't like that personally. Some people don't mind it, uh, but I prefer the smoother, more natural uh, cuts. And so I always am going to switch to this. But you do, there is a purpose and a time for using straight rigid cuts. If you ever need, you can do either or. So you can't, like, draw like you were drawing earlier in this in this um, stage? Yeah, you can. Instead of clicking? Yep. So you can't really see it. It's a really, really faint line right now, but yeah, I just I can... drew a big, a big cut and it's going to calculate it and it automatically is going to cut to complete that line. See? So yeah, this so is the line that I drew here. It was like a very fine wire it looked like on the screen. Yep. And Thank you, Sherry, for asking that because I get to demonstrate my absolute mo fa most favorite thing about using CAD programs is the freedom of being able to do whatever you want and just to go back. You can click undo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that because making mistakes and stuff is something you can't do in somebody's real mouth, but in the software, we can make all the mistakes we want, see how anything is going to look depending on what we want to do, and then just undo if we don't like it. The beauty of the undo button. I know. Um, so that's the spline tool. Next, we're going to talk about the plane cut tool. Uh, this one's pretty quick and easy. It's a straight tool cut. And you can see if I um, use just my mouse and drag, it's going to create a line wherever I want, a perfectly straight line. But the great thing is if I hold control here and move my mouse, uh, it is actually going to make this uh, plane cut be parallel with our occlusion, occlusal plane that we drew in the beginning. Um, so a really nice feature to have some symmetry there between your occlusal plane and your top of your base. Um, one thing you'll notice is as you can see this blue line here as I'm cutting, as I come down further, you'll see it disappear. Don't worry, that's totally normal. <laughs> What's happening is the palette here is actually deeper than the base back here. And so the system has a harder time rendering or showing you that cut. And so uh, it kind of messes things up in the system just a little bit. It tricks the system. But you can see that's actually the cut that it's going to make. Um, but I actually prefer this. It helps me because now I can know, oh, that's where my palette starts. So I need to go just a little above that. And it helps me get the thin models I can cut off as much as possible without having to guess. Yeah, where that palette is. Matthew, we do have a question. Um, someone would like to know what the advantages of using this um, versus model builder or having a closed model generated from scan at dental. Um, I can, I can help answer that question on the yeah model think, builder side. Uh, model builder, from my understanding, can be a little faster, um, but this program it has a little bit more control over how big the model is how tall it is and everything like that but it also sets you up for future appliances and future 
um, application. So if you needed to do aligners or anything like that, this would be for sure the way you would want to go. Okay. Yeah. So for um, another, so for between the two different softwares, let's say if you wanted to go into doing like a liner therapy or any sort of uh, the appliance designer applications inside of ortho system, uh, this is actually going to set you up faster going this route for creating your closed model instead of using like model builder and then importing in uh, you'd have you'd be using two separate softwares at that point in time instead of just one single software so that would be two expenses you'd have to pay for in the long run um, now if you're looking just to do models only models only and you you're not concerned if it's on an ortho base or not then uh, an avenue would be to go for model builder, for example, uh, if you'd never planned on stepping into the appliance designer applications, uh, like Matt said. And now, if you needed a model that had a ortho base on it, then your avenue would be going through the, the route that Matt's showing today. Uh, but if you just needed a model and you want it closed, then you could go through model builder. Or, for example, I see in the, the question, it says, what about just generating a closed model from scan it dental? So you can scan it as a, like, uh, if you set up your order form for a splint, and then you go through the scanning process, you have the ability to close the model there, you can close it there, and then export it as SDL and print it. Uh, one distinct advantage that model builder has over all of those methods is the ability to hollow a model. Um, so that is an advantage there. I don't believe the uh, uh, modeling software inside of ortho system gives you the ability to create a hollow model. Is that correct, Matt? Unfortunately, that is correct. It is one of the very evident uh, problems that is in the software and confusing as well because it's in both three shape are they both are three shape programs but there are features in one that could be used in the other and vice versa okay good i hope that i hope that answered the question to its uh uh completeness yeah um moving forward now that we have since we're going to be designing a holly retainer on this we want all of that palette to be printed though so i am done with the cuts I'm actually going to showcase um, the other tools here. I'm going to quickly touch on this morphing tool. And Corey, you might be able to answer this question. I do not know. For four years, I never used this tool, really. And I have no idea why it's in the ortho system. The only time I did use it was when I had like a hole or an artifact that was really hard to reach and I needed to cut it off. I would use the morphing tool to pull it out to make it more accessible and then cut it off. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's just part of the Sculpt Toolkit. So it's built into most likely the algorithm when 3Shape designed the Sculpt Toolkit completely um, inside Dental System and it probably just floated over to Ortho System. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't I don't know any any, any true need for it here. Um, let's see, I think that's, I mean, I, I don't I don't think of any other reason for it. Yeah, because um, I've seen people use it when they're designing crowns and stuff in the dental yeah. system. And that makes sense because you're artistically morphing a structure that's not part of their anatomy yet. But here, this is all their anatomy. And if I morph <laughs> any of this, it's not going to fit an appliance. Um, so, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, I, I don't think of any, I don't think there's actually any use for it. I think it's just that it was part of the coding when they created the the toolkit and it just they probably just copy and pasted the coding you know probably yeah. to each each process um the next yeah. tool go I ahead just, real quick matt um so um min <laughs> i'm gonna call him out he, <laughs> he actually he's calling himself the heckler but you know we, we love you and you're not a heckler my friend but he is <laughs> Um, letting us know that you can actually grab the ortho-based model from the order folder, import it as mo a model builder order, and hollow the model if you want to save on resin and print ortho study models. So there you go. There is a, a way to there do it. There is a way to do it. <laughs> Thank you, Min. Yeah, we actually, <clears throat> in my lab, we used uh, NetFab if we wanted to hollow out a model. Um, we would use NetFab to hollow the model out, and then we would put drain holes um, and that was a process we started a couple of years ago to do 
study models. So digital print of those white stone plaster study models. We were 3D printing those. Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. So just let, every, let everybody know we prefer being heckled. Yeah. And so don't ask, don't ask questions. We want to be heckled <laughs> for, for, for real before the meeting, before this webinar yesterday, we were all, we all have a meeting and I, I told Matt, I was literally just going to heckle him with, yeah. with ridiculous <laughs> questions, which I haven't yep. broke out yet. Not yet. Not yet. I'm waiting. <laughs> is your computer powered on or is it <laughs> off? <I'm... laughs> I, I see nothing. Yeah. Um, so the next part is this wax knife, and this is going to be a lot more useful if you are scanning um, plaster models in or impressions because digital scans oftentimes don't have the air bubbles or the imperfections that um, plaster models have. And so most of the time you want to try to leave the scan as much as possible to what the scan was in the first place. Um, for this instance, though, I'm just going to demonstrate kind of what you can do with these. Uh, I have it set to the plus or the add tool. And here you can see the radius is set with this scalar and the intensity of the tool is set with this scalar. So if you wanted a really small but very fast moving addition, you can see how it very quickly adds material. Or if you want a very big, but very, very subtle touches, you can see how it, it slowly adds material to that. Um, this is a good way to kind of smooth things out. Um, the other one is the subtraction. Same concept, just in subtracting from the model. This would be used more for air bubbles in plaster models that you run into very commonly with impressions in plaster models. Um, are there any hotkeys? I was just gonna, yeah, I was just <laughs> gonna say once you uh, get used to this program, there's a few different things that you can do. You can see down here there's one through seven, and you can actually save the the settings. So if you know that you like this radius and this intensity, you can hit the save button and hit one, and it's gonna ask if you want to overwrite that tool setting, and you can say yes. So now if I move all of these settings around, go to the blur tool, and then I click number one on my keyboard, you can see it automatically switches over to those settings that I had before. Awesome. Another key factor or big thing that I got used to and found a way more helpful than the buttons even is holding shift and scrolling your mouse button will change the radius and holding control and scrolling your mouse button up and down will change the intensity. So when you get into a good workflow, you can instead of shifting between keys, if you know exactly, or you're close to the settings that you want, you can just scroll until you find what you're looking for. You know, it'd be interesting to see if you went into a laboratory and went to the design section and just looked at the control and shift key on a keyboard and see how worn out it is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I'm sure that's probably where the most designers live at. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, the other tool is the blur tool. Um, I have really, really mixed controversial feelings about this tool. <laughs> I don't know about you, Corey, but I, every time I see when I was training somebody and I would see them using this tool, it like just made me die a little bit inside. I could see for, for, for this type of application. Yes, because you're, you're altering the, the actual dentition of the patient and whatever yeah. application you fit on top of that, it's not going to fit. And so you, You'd, you'd either have to add or subtract defects but for for here i don't i don't see a, a need for it. i think this is one of uh, you know the wax knife was another copy and paste feature from yep. the other and it, it is really software. helpful for like i said plaster models um but it just even if i had to do this carving to get this gingiva back a little bit better some more den, um definition there i just have found that using the plus and the minus tool together, you can get much crisper, more um, accurate designs. Yeah. Not not necessarily for, uh, like you said, on the dentition, on the uh, dental system side, when you're designing crowns and stuff, those tools definitely have a place for that as well. 
Um, I, I don't have a case. I was just talking to Corey about this this morning. I don't have a case with braces on, and I know we were going to talk about removing braces. So what I'm going to do is actually just manually create some artifacts on some teeth to show everybody kind of the tool that you would use to remove braces and what that looks like. Um, because this actually, believe it or not, I mean, that's a little extreme, but. Uh, <laughs> that's a very, that's a very unique bracket that's, you have. There. Yes. What? But Who manufactures that uh, brackets or attachments for uh, Invisalign. Yeah. Or, you know, Invisalign, I have to say with quote, quotations, but invisible aligners, I guess. Ali I we could we could call it aligner therapy. Aligner therapy. Yes. So you can put attachments on. Um, and if a doctor or uh, if you're a doctor that uses those, you can remove those um, digitally before prepping. So you don't have to have those things removed from your patient um, too early. Yeah. Um, but it's this little Band-Aid tool. And I always recommend making sure that you have the area around the artifact cleaned up. And I'll show you kind of what I mean if I come around here and make this just a little bit wider. Um, believe it or not, I have, yeah, I've seen dentists, dentists and uh, orthodontists send in brackets that the brackets are literally jammed into the gum tissue and they ask us to remove them and that's really not uncommon you mean uh, like the scanner just like morphed it to the tissue nope i mean the the brackets literally come down and you cannot see the gum line for like a good one third of this tooth right down here that's good yes um anyway so i'm going to show you why you want to clean it up first and not try to just use this tool to do all the work for you um so what you do is you can you can paint the whole surface. I like to go around just the whole thing in a big circle. But if I click apply, it does a pretty good job. But you can see this portion down here kind of carried over into this section here. Um, yeah. What it, this tool does is it kind of takes the average contour of every uh, the whole circumference and then tries to average out and guess where the surface would go. Um, so you can do that and then just come through here with your sculpt tool and reshape if you want to do that. Or you can take the time to do this, like what I'm doing here first, and then go in and use the, the sculpt tool or the um, remove artifact tool. And you can see once you have a much better outline of, of your artifact, a cleaner portion, you can see it makes a much smoother, much more accurate removal of that artifact. You can do multiples at a time. Um, in real application, I've found that it's easier to do usually at most two or three at a time because at that point, you're gonna have to come back and re-sculpt the, the anatomy of the teeth. And it's difficult to do that on all of the teeth. It's easier to kind of see where the teeth are sitting actively when you're doing it one at a time. Any questions or any thoughts to add? Corey? I don't know that all that looks good so far. We don't have any questions uh, in here yet. So I, I'm going to assume you're doing a great job since nobody has any. <laughs> no questions. Nobody, no questions yet. <laughs> Besides, I mean, we've, we've had a couple of questions. Uh, yes. But not uh, um, not a, a large amount, so. You're doing great. Cool. Well, the maxil or the maxillary is the first step, and the mandibular is the second. And I always say second first is the same as the first. So we just come in here and do um, the same thing again. This one I'm going to actually I do my mandibulars a little different than I do my maxillary. I do one cut starting at the back of the teeth and connect this whole line. So we, we had a question that came through that says, when you sculpt or re-sculpt the teeth or sculpt on the teeth, how can you be sure you're not changing the true anatomy of the dentition? That's a good question. Uh, we can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a, a lot of just practice and experience of knowing what the anatomy looks like and your best estimate. Yeah. Uh, I will say that it's usually better to err on the on the side of adding a little too much material, though, than it is to subtracting material. But yeah, 
a, a good rule of thumb is to to know that you're not adjusting the dentition is to not touch the dentition when <laughs> you're using the, the sculpt toolkits. Now we do have another great question that came through. So while we're still on the sculpt toolkit, uh, we had a question that says, "Can you demo how to fix a chipped in sizeal edge?" So uh, if you want to go ahead and chip a yeah. lower tooth and then show how you can fill it back in. Um, I think that would be uh, an excellent demonstration. Chip as in, if it, it's, not, I'm assuming the, the question is asking like, if you're sculpting or doing something and you accidentally chip a tooth? Nope. So or... let's say, let's say the patient had a chip tooth um, and the doctor went ahead and scanned them. Uh, and then they're going to, let's say do like a liner therapy and they were going to fill that chip tooth with a composite how would you potentially render a fix for it? Um, pretty much the sculpt toolkit, but if we come in here, I'll just draw a little chip. There we go. Uh, so there's a couple of ways you can do it. The best way is gonna be with your wax knife though. Um, and coming in with the, the addition tool and just sculpting it back up. Now for, I, for go ahead. I was gonna say for everybody that's watching, if you saw now what Matt did right off the bat without even thinking is he made the size of the circle the size of the chip. And so that's a a uh, a, a crucial step. And so when he when you go through and you're going to fill an area inside of three shape, if you have that circle of the uh, wax knife larger than the area you're trying to fill, it's gonna it's gonna extrude everything outside of it. And so, because of Matt's experiences and experience itself, he automatically went and made his circle with the sculpt toolkit the same size as the chip, and just it automatically just fills it in as soon as he starts left clicking and moving his mouse around. Yeah, and I always have um, found that it's better to add a little too much than what I'm doing and then to sculpt back down, to carve yeah. back down to where I, what I want. Um, but it's always, you know, kind of the same adage of doing anything with lumber or any woodworking is, you know, measure twice, cut once kind of thing. But like you can, you, you, you want to add as little amount at a time so that you don't add like a huge chunk and then realize, oh, I messed up and I need to redo all this. Yeah. Um, adding little bits at a time when you have something like an art. I would, I would call that more of an artistic um, uh, pursuit there because there's really no way for us to know. But the idea is trying to get something that matches enough to be able to fit an appliance well. Yep. Um, but yeah, so in this case, you can see I cut a, a horseshoe because uh, we don't need any of the base or anything for making an Essex retainer. Um, what you can do, again, this is all just, if you're wanting to take the time, it becomes a, a balance between where's your time gonna be better spent? Do you wanna spend your time carving more of these models out so that you're spending less on resin or do you wanna spend more of your time prepping more models and the age old question of what's more valuable for you? But you can kind of come through and, and carve down as much as you want. Another thing that you can do that I actually implemented in our lab was uh, we were doing a lot of what are called three to threes, uh, lower lingual bars, basically just a bar that goes from the canine to the canine to hold the teeth in place, the anteriors. And when they're making those, they don't need any of the posterior teeth. So what we started doing was just carving down here at the first bicuspids. And it's not gonna let me do that because I cut that off. But if I undo. Do you know why they call it a three to three? Because it goes from tooth number three to tooth number three. In FDI notation. Yes. <laughs> nerd. Yeah, I know I am, I am a big nerd. <laughs> Oh man. So yeah, so now I can hit uh, play on this and now we have just the portion of the teeth that we need to make the appliance and that saves a ton of time and you can fit three or four of these on where you could only fit one arch on originally if you're just doing a three to three. It's just a fun oh. little trick. 
but that's pretty much it. Any questions so far? I have a question. All right, so let's say we're done. How do I get my STL file out? Yeah, we can show you that next. Uh, there was one more question that just popped up. Before I get out of the design portion, I want to make sure we're done with all those questions. <laughs> it, I don't know if it was, it was, it was more a statement. It's, it's, <laughs> America, friend. America, the only country that uses universal number system. Perfect. <laughs> oh, yeah, the European number, the FDI. It took me so long to figure out how that has like 11. Where's one? I, it doesn't make any sense. And then I finally, it dawned on me that they're using the quarters the section yeah uh, it's kind of funny when you do uh, uh uh when we do trainings and if we do not switch it to the universal numeric and it's at fdi and it's like go ahead and select tooth number 43 and they like everybody's you can see the technician start twitching yeah, <laughs> yeah but it compute. makes so much more sense like it's so much easier to calculate for the fourth quadrant third tooth than it is to count tooth number i don't know 17 yeah, no, it makes Personally. sense. Yeah. Oh, man. Anyway, so once you're done. <laughs> Let me guess. You're going to say that we should all switch to the metric system as well. <laughs> it does. It is It is making more sense. Yes, tens, increments of tens. Um, anyways, once you're done with your, your build and you want to print, uh, you just can right click and export. And you can export your models right here. And what that's going to do is send your models to your database wherever that is saved. I don't have my screen share up on this, so I can't show you what it would look like, but um, I can switch. Do you, uh, do you want me to switch over to that to show them the database, what it looks like? Yeah, if you want real quick, just just for uh, curiosity. And just to let everybody know while, while Matt's setting that up, the uh, this webinar is being recorded and it does qualify for your CE credits. And so if you need CE credits in the next one to two days, you will receive an email with instructions on how to receive the credits themselves. So you can see my uh, there we file go. explorer now? Okay. Yeah. Um, so in your, it's gonna be different probably for some of you, but if you have a server and everything like that, there's different ways of saving it. You can kind of pick where you want your uh, database to be. Mine's just the default one, but we go into our ortho data folder and this has all of our cases that we've done. And we just did Jane Doe, one, two, three, four. And this is where if you had multiple model sets for the same patient, this is where they would pop up. You could see your beginning models or if you had your final models. Um, and then within each model set, this is where all of your information is saved. Uh, the models that we exported are going to always be in this models folder. And there we have our exported models in STL format. From there, you would just put it in with your nesting software for whatever 3D printer you have. Or if you're going to mill them, um, then you would talk to Corey. <laughs> awesome. So, Very um, good. Matt, can you uh, let us know what our next session is going to be on and when we will uh, be hosting that? Um, I know all of the different things that we talked about. What did we, I think we're doing aligners. Let me see what's on the, the, the thing. Hold up. Let me see if I got the thing. Hang on a <laughs> second. <laughs> Uh, so I believe, let's see here next. Oh, where did it go? I just had it up just a second ago. I closed out Pretty of it. Pretty sure it's aligners. Let me Look, see I, if I put you on the spot. Now I did <laughs> put us all on the spot. Let's see if. Uh, let's see, Chelsea Phillips, I was looking to see if I had an email from her in regards to the future ones. Let me see. Webinar. I know we're going to do, uh, you're doing one on the aligner therapy, uh, and you're going to do one on indirect bonding trays. And then I think we're going to do one more specialty one, uh, the uh, for uh, possible, possibly maybe an expander type application. Uh, let me see if I can find this real quick. 
I think splints uh, was also on oh, the list. Oh, splints and night guards. So yeah, I just found it. Aligners, indirect bonding, and splints and night guards. Night guards. Yeah. All right, awesome. So this is just the first part of our webinar, webinar series for Ortho. And so we'll be looking forward to having you all attend on the future series. This was kind of like, get your basic set. And then the next ones are gonna do deeper dives into the appliance designer application and the uh, therapy applications. So very exciting. I just wanna thank Matt uh, for his time today. And thank you, Sherry, for your time as well. And thank you, of course, to all of the uh, all of the attendees that joined us today, and I hope everybody had a uh, excellent Thanksgiving, a great break. And um, actually, it looks like we have the the next one's looking like it's going to be on December fifteenth. So that should be a let's see, that should be a Tuesday. So it's two weeks from today, Tuesday the fifteenth, right before uh, a week before Christmas holiday. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you all for attending and y'all have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye guys. Bye.